Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hey guys, Kevin Cruz here. Welcome to the LeadX Leadership Show, where we help you to stand out and to get ahead at work. Now, as you know, we like to switch things up here, keep it interesting, and to continue that tradition, today on the podcast, instead of me interviewing an expert guest, we're going to have the guest deep dive into their topic. You see, you'll be hearing audio from a LeadX webinar. Now, of course, there are dozens of great webinars on leadership, management, communication, productivity, and more, all archived in the LeadX app. Just visit leadx.org for more information about our webinar archive. So enough on the setup, enough background information. Here is Vanya Mathis to introduce our guest and to hand it over to them. Enjoy. Hi, Vanya here. Welcome to Intuitive Decision Making to Spark Innovation. Today, you're going to learn how your intuitive intelligence communicates with you, how to use your inner compass for effective decision making, and how to translate your intuitive intelligence into innovative results. Our next host is an international business coach, writer, speaker, and consultant, and an expert in mentoring, training, and teaching others how to utilize the process of bringing intuition into an effective business plan and culture. He's currently the CEO of Invisible Edge, and his breakthrough strategies have been implemented by executives worldwide. He now helps professionals access their intuitive leadership skills for decision-making on a global scale. Please welcome Rick Snyder. Hi, so I am Rick Snyder, and I'm very excited to be with you today to talk about my book, Decisive Intuition. And most importantly, one of the skills that we don't talk a lot about in terms of leadership, yet it's one of those invisible edges that gives you an incredible advantage uh, in how you manage people, in how you do strategic planning, in how you intuit the marketplace and where things are moving. And so that you can be one of the disruptors and not being one of the people who will actually get disrupted. So this is an incredible topic and we're going to weave that into a very practical area around decision making and how you can actually make better decisions when you include your intuition with the outer data and the research that's available to you. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So this book was launched in March and um, I am the CEO and founder, as you know, of Invisible Edge. So we're actually bringing intuitive intelligence to leaders and teams of all walks and sizes and shapes uh, from corporates to startups. And we're seeing amazing results when executives and teams are willing to tune into that deeper intelligence and actually learn how to trust it and learn how to recognize their own intuitive language. And then most excitingly, putting that into application in so many areas of a business. So we'll be getting into that today, as well as what gets in the way of your intuition and how are ways that you might sabotage your own connection with your deeper intelligence um, that might be getting in the way of your results. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. This is a true story here. So this is actually, I used to live in Europe for three and a half years, and this is in the town, the island of Sardinia. And so this is an example of what happens when you don't listen to your intuition. And let's see how many of you out there can relate to this. So there I was driving around in my little Fiat 500 and Google Maps said, go right. Well, it's Google Maps. So the data said, go right. And yet I had a distinct feeling in the pit of my stomach to not go right. And yet what happens, like most people, maybe I listen to Google Maps and I overrode my intuition and my inner signals and cues. And so I decided to go right, even though my body was saying, don't go. Don't make the turn. So when I go down this narrow alleyway, like what you see on the right here, and then what happens is the alleyway continues to get more narrow and more narrow and more narrow. And then all of a sudden my rear view mirrors start taking out all the mailboxes of both sides of the apartments down the uh, street. And then um, some of the corners of the buildings start taking out and digging into the side panels of the car and creating all this damage like this huge deep dent and scrape across the whole side panel of the car on both sides. I finally get out of the alleyway um, and I escaped with, you know, thousands of dollars of damage on this car. And so for me, that's one example 
of a consequence of what happens when we override our instincts and our intuitions that we feel all the time. And so just think about that for a second. How often have you stayed in a career that you could feel was a dead end for you, but you were still there? Um, maybe this has shown up in relationships where, you know, the courage to actually jump into a relationship, even though you might have hesitation. Um, and so there's all these ways where we're getting signals and cues all the time of a certain pathway that's in our highest purpose and connected to our highest values. But it doesn't mean we always listen to that because when it's Google Maps or the data on the spreadsheet or the louder voices in the room of the team meeting, it can sometimes be really hard to stand up for what we're really feeling on a deeper level and having the courage to put that out there in the team meeting or in a conversation with a colleague or whatever it might be. So this brings us to really the heart of the matter here. And this is around making decisions. And so why I call the book Decisive Intuition is I find that leaders usually err on one side of the spectrum or the other. So usually I find that sometimes leaders are very decisive, in fact, and they don't even consider other options. They just shoot from the hip. Sometimes they can be very impulsive to the extreme, and they're just really quick at making decisions. And of course, sometimes that's fantastic. But other times that can really hurt a business and hurt the leadership when you're not considering other voices uh, or other trusted advisors around you, or even taking a moment to pause and to listen for, is this actually in the best interest of our company? And are we asking all the right questions before we jump into the decision? Or am I more about you know, fire ready aim? And so that's one side of the spectrum. The other side are people and leaders who are very intuitive. And they, they are able to uh, really wait for the answer and they're more patient. And they're, but sometimes the error on that side is if you wait too long and you're waiting for the magical answer to show up for you and it's not coming. And yet you have to make a decision. And if you pause for too long, your competition's already made a decision. In fact, the latest research shows that the best time to weave your intuition in the decision-making process is when you have about 40 to 70% of the data. If you don't have even 40% of the data, then you're really kind of shooting from the hip. And a lot of times you're making a guess. If you're waiting till you have more than 70% of the data, you're waiting too long. In fact, Jeff Bezos of Amazon uh, frequently says, if you're waiting till you have like 90% of the data, your competition has already made a decision and you're way behind. So there really is this some science to this 40 to 70% sweet spot of including your inner signals and cues that you're getting along with the outer data and metrics to make the best decision possible. Okay. So as we see thought leaders from our history, but also our current times and the real change agents, the real innovators all knew about intuition from people from Steve Jobs here who says, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. Everything else is secondary. And he's obviously someone who really modeled tuning in and staying connected to that inner guidance, even if people around you think you're nuts. You know, how, um, in, how detailed he was about design and intuitive design and making Apple very specific in certain ways to the customer and the user interface and making it approachable and relatable while other PC manufacturers had no concept of that. They had no intuition about that. They were just trying to make faster, better processing units. Um, but he understood the human element. People like Oprah Winfrey, who is, as you all know, an incredible media mogul and entrepreneur in her own right. And she says, my business skills have come from being guided by my inner self, my intuition. In fact, in another quote, she talks about how the biggest mistakes that she's ever made in business is when she didn't listen to her intuition. And we have Einstein and other famous inventors like Nikolai Tesla and people who really create things and innovate know the value of listening to that inner hunch, a different way of doing it, that innovative track. In fact, Aristotle, um, talk about back in the day, Aristotle would say, intuition is the source of scientific knowledge. It's a really interesting quote because nowadays 
there seems to be a false war between science and intuition. And people who are really scientific and rational often don't think of intuition as dependable, reliable. And yet, if you look at the real heart of even the scientific method, one of the steps of the scientific method is developing a hypothesis. You know, it's developing a hunch. You know, I have a feeling we could do it a different way. I have a feeling we could screw in the light bulb or try a different way of solar paneling than what's out there. And that's trusting your intuition. It's a big part of the scientific process. And nowadays, with neurobiology and neuroscience, we're finally understanding how intuition works, which we're about to get into in a moment here. So what is intuition? I've been talking about this a lot today. Intuition, I have a slightly different definition that's a little more user-friendly and approachable and something that you can practice. So my definition is it's an embodied knowing that comes from listening to what wants to happen next. So it's not just in your head. It's an, a knowing that comes from tuning into your whole body experience, all the cells in your body, from your feet to your neck to your head, all of it, your whole experience. Because that's where we're getting data all the time. We literally have neuroreceptors in almost every cell of our body. And so when we're open to how information comes to us uh, as we're moving in the world, or we're in a team meeting, or we're in a sales conversation, or we're leading the company stand-up meeting, and we're noticing half the team is asleep, and we're picking up those signals and cues and all the nonverbal communication, that's where this comes in very powerfully, is by opening up to all the receptors in our whole body we're picking up on all the data in the business space and also outside too. And then listening to what wants to happen next. This is a key piece of intuition is it's a conversation. It's a relationship. I'm actually listening for, oh, what wants to happen next in our strategy session? What wants to happen next in our product launch? You know, do we actually want to launch the product even though we haven't done all the beta testing because we're worried about our competition? Or is it actually feel right to hold off on that, even though that's difficult, and to delay our product launch for another quarter? And so these are the difficult questions all of you face every day, every week. And so imagine if you're not using this amazing resource of your intuition, and you haven't developed a trustable, reliable um, uh, conversation and relationship with that resource, then you're missing out on such an amazing capacity to lead. You're missing out on one of those invisible skills that's going to be in more and more demand in the future. So these are the three main premises of my book, that intuition is within you, that we all have it. We all have this resource. It's also learnable. It's something that you can teach. Something that me and my team are very passionate about is actually teaching executive teams and leaders how to actually access their intuitive skills and develop them so that they're better at anticipating the future and also reading out what wants to happen in real time. Those are the two biggest assets of intuition, which is the next premise, it's your invisible edge. It gives you literally an edge over the competition from those who are not tapping into their intuition. So once again, it allows you to be more responsive because you're tuning into what's happening in your environment in real time. You're picking up all the data, so you're, you're better able to make choices on the fly. Um, and then secondly, you're better able to anticipate the future. You're getting a sense of where things are moving and how the marketplace is moving, how AI might be impacting your industry right now, um, how your team, the mood of your team and getting to intuit that and what needs to happen to inspire and motivate. These are some of the amazing outcomes when you start to develop your intuitive skills. There's also a phrase I want to introduce you to around intuitive intelligence. So intuitive intelligence is the ability to access your subconscious mind for faster and more integrated decision making. Most of the time, we're operating in our awake state from our conscious rational mind. And that's often when we get a report or some analytics, um, we're discussing some new data, we're consciously using our critical mind to engage and to think about strategy and next steps. And that's great. That's wonderful. There's, of course, a place for critical thinking, and there should be more of that, I, I vouch for. On the other side, what also science is showing today is that we, when we access our subconscious mind, we're actually able to connect the dots faster and more integrated 
than if we're only using our rational mind. Our rational mind is a limited tool and it actually limits our ability of all that we're tracking in, in the moment. So we'll get into that in a second. So what I'm saying is intuitive intelligence is emotional intelligence 2.0. It's the next nuance and the next wave of accessing our full capacity as human beings and as leaders. So um, into emotional intelligence, that book by Daniel Goleman came out 24 years ago and it complete has completely revolutionized the business space. I would argue being a consultant in the business field for a while now that the business world didn't really catch on to the value of emotional intelligence until maybe the last eight or 10 years. Now it's kind of a no brainer for companies that are leading to pay attention to things like empathy and uh, communication and understanding the emotional needs of your buyer and your, your client and your customer. Also your staff and your team and the people you manage and to be able to understand what's happening with them on emotional levels, emotive levels, and also energetics, nonverbal communication, how incredibly valuable that is in all types of communication in general. So if you're going to be an effective leader in this next millennia, emotional intelligence is a must. And so what I'm saying is that's true as a foundation and intuitive intelligence is also a must. And it's actually the next wave of nuance for leaders. And so if you see, as you see in this image here, this, this woman is connected from her heart center to the whole data set around her, the whole matrix code around her. And so why this is interesting now is we're being flooded by more data than we've ever been flooded with before. Especially with the advent of AI, virtual reality, big data, um, all the different channels and social media that we're flooded to on a daily basis. And by the way, this is only going to continue. Our ability to develop our human intuition and our ability to discern all the data around us into what's actually meaningful and what's actually important and reliable is going to be more important than ever that we learn how to locate what is the story that the data is telling us. Data doesn't mean anything to human beings unless you can tell its story. So if you can actually translate what the data is telling you and how to slice the data, um, how to actually, what's the way we're going to look at that data? Do we have any biases that are going into how we, um, how we code the data, how we track the data. We know there's a lot of human bias in data also. It's not as pure as we think it is. This is why it's so important that we're using and developing our human intuition in coordination with all the raw data around us so that we know how to use it wisely and we know how to slice and track that as well. So I predict intuitive intelligence will be one of the cutting edge uh, waves that we're going to continue to see. We're already seeing it in all the different magazines right now from Fast Company to Inc. to Forbes uh, to Entrepreneur, etc. around intuitive leadership. Uh, this will be a really hot topic in the coming decade. So let's get into the science of it. So the neurobiology of intuition. And so this is where it gets really exciting. So why the subconscious mind is so important is that's really what's happening underneath the surface in all of our conversations. So even though you're in a team meeting and one of your stakeholders is saying something, there's all the iceberg of what's going on underneath the surface of how, how they're saying it. You know, what's their cadence and their tone? What else are they communicating in what they're not saying? Um, what's their body language telling you? What's their posture telling you? And so the subconscious mind, what gets interesting here is, um, I'll, I'll start with the conscious mind, is actually tracking uh, 40 bits of data per second. So they've actually found this out. Um, Bruce Lipton, a, new, uh, um, a cell biologist, um, has uncovered that, that the conscious mind tracks 40 bits of data per second of what, you're, what you can actually be aware of in the moment. So you might be aware of someone's voice, the sounds in the room, etc. But your subconscious mind is actually tracking 20 million bits of data per second. So 40 bits versus 20 million bits. That's why the subconscious mind is so powerful. And the subconscious mind is found out throughout the whole body. It's not actually up here in your rational mind. It's in all of your cells of your whole being. That's why being embodied as a leader and tapping into your leadership presence is going to be more important than ever because you'll be able to tune into your whole instrument 
and your whole antenna and be able to read out all the decisions you need to make in real time, faster, and more holistically as well. You're automatically having a 360 view when you're coming from a subconscious perspective than only just coming from your rational conscious mind. Once again, it's like a, the difference of a little two dirt track on your bicycle versus a 20 lane highway of information. And studies have been showing that when you weave in intuition, you actually make better decisions than when you just use your critical thinking and conscious mind, especially when you're facing uncertainty and complexity. And chances are, if you're listening to this webinar and this podcast, you're facing uncertainty and complexity probably on a daily basis. So here's the six steps to tapping into your intuition. The book will go into far more depth of how to actually do this, but just to name the steps here, just to get you in that mode. The first step is just being more receptive, having a mindset that's open so that your intuition can actually find you. If you're an expert and you think you know everything, there's no room for more input to come in. So you're not going to even recognize when your intuition's knocking on the door. So the first big step is being open, having an open mindset. Number two is then slowing down. We have to be willing to slow down from our normal pace. Also because our thoughts spin so rapidly and scramble and are all over the place and random a lot of times, we actually need to slow down so that we can tap into that deeper intuition, which often is more like a sonar wave. It's a slower wave of intelligence. It's deeper also, but it's also slower. So we need to slow down to catch what's already there waiting for us to arrive. So slowing down is a big component. It also helps reduce the outer noise around us and all the entertainment and all the social media channels, etc. Once we slow down, we get rid of the outer noise. We then have to deal with our inner noise. And this is the whole inner critic. This is that part of us that's always sabotaging and saying things like, oh, we don't have time for this. We got to get back to work. I got a strict deadline. This is ridiculous. Why am I gazing at my navel right now? All the critical thoughts that take you out of the voice of your intuition. So we have a whole chapter dedicated on separating the voice of your inner critic from the voice of your intuition. And that's where the deeper uh, intelligence is found. And so it takes a little work to separate and identify when am I coming from my inner critic, which is not helpful versus coming from that deeper innate intelligence that I have. Then I can listen to my body. Now that I've made that separation, um, I can now listen to my body and get even deeper into my inner guidance and my own intuitive language and signals and cues. Once I have a sense of how my intuition works and we all have a different way that our intuition works, we have different languages. Sometimes people get images uh, and sometimes people have, hear audio messages. I get a lot of feeling and sensation. A lot of times I'll get a feeling in my solar plexus or my gut or my heart. And so that's another way that intuition can speak to you is how you feel things. Some people get uh, intuitive downloads in their dream states because once again, that's where the subconscious mind speaks to us. And so some people get amazing inventions and innovations through dream states or just coming in or out of a dream. Um, sometimes people report just a knowing. They just get this knowing sensation that comes over them or they just know the relationship's over or they know that this career track needs to shift into a different space or they know that they need to open up a new location even though it's scary. And so this fifth step is asking for guidance. It's being willing to put out there a question and saying, hey, intuition, um, should, should, should we hire this person? Is this person a fit for our team? Should we delay the product launch? And then actually going quiet and listening and having some time to take out of your business and of your daily to-do list to actually reflect and listen after you've made that, that, that ask. Once you develop that relationship, then you have a reliable tool for your inner compass that you've now earned the right for. And that's an amazing tool to rely on for all your decision making. Of course, still including your research and data out there and other people's intuition too, but you're not ignoring what you feel. And that's where the last step comes into play is taking action. Being willing to take action on your inner intelligence. And this is really what separates living a life that's on purpose and powerful and coming from all of you that's embodied and holistic versus not trusting yourself and not having the conversations you know you need to have and your business having a big impact because of that. 
And there's a big risk, uh, the risk of mediocrity or the risk of failure when you're not really coming from your leading edge. And so that's what really I'm standing for today is that when you're coming from your deeper intuitive essence, you're coming from all of you. You're bringing all of you to work. And that's powerful. And that's what, motiv- that's what moves people. That's what inspires people. Really quickly, some of the things that get in the way of our intuition is that rational mind. If we're always logical and, and rational, we're not deepening into our, uh, the, the deeper recesses of our creativity and our innovation and that creative mindset. Because we know what we know. We don't know what we don't know. And so that's where we have to put on pause what we know so we can discover what we don't know. Busyness, always being busy as we've talked about. The ego, if I have a personal agenda about something, that will get in the way of my intuition because intuition might lead me towards areas that are not always comfortable, but it's what's right for the bigger picture. And that my ego might have a different preference. So that can sometimes clash. Doubt, where I doubt myself, uh, is a way that we sabotage our deeper inner intelligence. And also fear, and also strong emotions in general, but fear is usually the strongest emotion uh, that can take us out of our intuition because we're paralyzed. We're not going to be in a space where we're listening to what wants to happen next because we're too uh, hijacked by fear. A couple quick tools that will help you. And you might be asking, well, how do I hack into my subconscious? And this is the kind of work we do live with people in workshops and also with coaching. Um, And so some ways that we've already talked about are relaxation. When you go into some kind of mindfulness state, uh, sometimes uh, for me, actually going to a steam room uh, or a sauna just relaxes my nervous system where I start to have these amazing creative thoughts that I've never had before because I'm relaxed. I have an executive I work with who goes on long drives uh, because his mind will go on autopilot and he'll open up into his deeper subconscious and he'll get new ideas for his business that he's never had before because he's, his mind is on autopilot, his conscious mind. Also, movement can be very helpful. People who swim, go for a run. Sometimes I'll go for a run and I get great ideas that are from a whole different angle than if I'm just sitting in front of the computer screen for another five hours. Play and improv classes can also open up new portals and doorways for creativity and music and art as well. Um, Sometimes state changes like getting outside. You know, Steve Jobs used to walk around the Apple campus barefoot slowly when he was fried, his mind was fried. He was staying in front of the computer screen for too long. He would walk out and slowly walk around the complex of Apple and get new innovations and ideas he'd never had before because he literally interrupted his normal way of thinking. So state changes can be very helpful. That's why people do leadership off-sites off-site because you're in a new environment. And also disrupting the conscious mind. There's mind puzzles and games you can play of distracting your conscious mind so your subconscious can do the real work. Uh, and there's also dialectic thinking when you hold the opposites of something, something that's possible and something that's impossible, and you hold both, sometimes a third uh, opportunity or creative t- creation, creative solution can actually happen that way too. And we have a lot of, of different um, techniques that we use when we work with executives to help them access that third solution. Um, this is one of the last things I want to show you today is you might be asking, well, how I get how intuition will help me as a leader. How would it actually impact my whole business? So here's what I want to share with you here today is intuition actually impacts every part of your business. So if we look at start at leadership down here below, leaders who are tapped into their inner knowing are more inspiring. You can feel it in their bones. They're not coming from, they're not borrowing leadership from someone else. They're coming from inside of themselves. They're visionary. You know, literally intuition is connected to your vision. Uh, They're also adaptive. They're able to make change happen in real time. Um, With customer relations, you can actually anticipate what the customer needs ahead of time. You can intuit that. You can personalize your solutions. You could have more creative solutions also because you're not just thinking inside the box. Um, As far as uh, performance, your team is more engaged when, they're, when you're bringing all of yourself to work. You're literally more innovative because you're bringing your creative elements and there's room for that in your company. And there's more cooperation. It's not just about me getting ahead and my agenda and my ego. It's about what's best for the business, what's best for our whole industry or you know, what we need to accomplish in the next three months. So it has you thinking about it in a bigger way. 
culture. Um, you know, you're more connected with each other. You're more engaged. You're, there's more improved retention. Uh, people are more empathic with each other because they're more intuitive in how they work together. And you're more alive. You're happy to go to work. You're excited. You're inspired. You're not just um, you know, feeling like a, a robot filling out data spreadsheets and entering coding. You're bringing your creativity to work also. And lastly, information and data. Um, you're open to more data when you're open to your intuition. Your subconscious mind is going to be picking up on more data than just your logical mind alone. So it immediately impacts the amount of data you're receiving, but also the narrative, how you tell the story of the data and how you slice the data and how you look at what model you're actually receiving the data through and what your perspective is and how, how does your model need to change and adapt depending on the, the data that you're getting. So that's where we're going to end here. I want to share three key, three key takeaways. Sorry. I want to share three key takeaways from uh, this, this session. So if I were to leave you with three things, it's this. Number one, get still. Dedicate at least five or 10 minutes of your day, carve that out, and yes, you're gonna have to carve that out intentionally, otherwise it's not gonna happen, where you can slow down and actually reflect and get clear about a question or a dilemma you might be facing in a business. So get still, and that's gonna take five or 10 minutes, whether you need to leave the office or turn off your notifications or close the door, whatever you need to do to get still. Number two, listen. Once you get still, listen to your, what is your intuition telling you? How do you decode your intuitive language? What are the signals and cues that you're getting about whatever question you have, whether it's a hiring decision or a strategic decision, starting to listen to your response. And then number three, act. Be willing to take action on what your intuitive senses are telling you. Start small. When you, learn, when you learn a new instrument, you don't get on stage right away. You practice. So just start with a small decision and just test it out and see what other people are getting also about that decision or assessment you might be making. But if you practice these three key takeaways here from today's session, you're going to start putting your intuitive intelligence into motion and you're going to have an invisible edge over your competition very fast. So thank you so much for tuning in today. And if you want any more information about what we offer, you can always follow us at info at invisibleedgellc.com. And that's also our website, invisible-edgellc.com. And of course, Decisive Intuition is out there wherever they sell books near you. And that will also help you deepen all that you've been learning about intuitive intelligence, how that helps you improve as a leader and actually stay on your leading edge to help your team lead to the next horizon. Thank you very much. Friends, if you like this episode of the LeadX Leadership Podcast, please take a minute, leave a rating on iTunes or Stitcher. Ratings are invaluable for attracting new listeners. And I like to convert those listeners into leaders because you know I'm on a mission to spark 100 million leaders in the next 10 years. And if you wanna become the boss everyone fights to work for and nobody wants to leave, Check out the LeadX platform with Coach Amanda at leadx.org. And if you have 10 or more managers who could use some binge-worthy training, send me an email at info at leadx.org, L-E-A-D-X dot O-R-G, and we'll talk about getting you set up with a totally free pilot for those managers. See if they like it. If they don't, that's fine. We go away. Part as friends. But if they love it, you've just found yourself a new resource for them. Remember, leadership is influence. You're always leading. How are you going to lead today?